Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the December Pacific Northwest Drought Early Warning System uh, Drought Climate Outlook webinar. Thank you to those that have joined us previously and to those joining us for the first time. My name is Megan Dalton, and I'm with the Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium, or CERC. This bi-monthly webinar series is hosted by NIDIS, CERC, and the Northwest Climate Hub. It is designed to provide stakeholders in the Northwest with timely drought and climate information. Each webinar is tailored to, re to reflect recent, current, and forecasted conditions and climatic events, and also includes some discussions of observed impacts and other relevant updates from across the region. Um, this time, however, we're going to focus a um, couple of our speakers on the recently released National Climate Assessment. Uh, just a note, a recording of the webinar and other supporting materials will be posted on drought.gov later this week. And another note, after today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to provide us feedback that will help, help us improve the webinar series. So please take a moment and tell us what you think. So today's speakers include uh, Kelsey Jensko, uh, Montana's state climatologist, who will present the climate recap and current conditions. Then Andrea Baer with the National Weather Service Western Region Office will present the climate outlook. And then the two speakers covering the National Climate Assessment will be um, first Gabrielle Roche McNally covering the Northwest chapter, um, and she's with the Northwest Climate Hub. And then Roger Pulwardi with the NOAA Earth Systems Research Lab will present the key findings of the water chapter. So please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions during the presentations, uh, and we'll address them if we have time, or we'll save them for the end during the Q&A period after all the presentations. So before we move into the presentations, uh, I'll briefly highlight partners that make the webinar series happen. So first, the Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium is a climate science to climate action team funded by NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Program. CERC supports communities, policymakers, and resource managers in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Western Montana as they work to adapt to the changing climate. Uh, next, the Northwest Climate Hub develops and delivers science-based region-specific technologies and practical information to assist agricultural and natural resource managers with climate-informed decision-making. And finally, I'll turn it over to Britt Parker to highlight uh, NIDIS and the Pacific Northwest Drought Early Warning System. Thank you, Megan. Uh, just very quickly, I'm the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for the Pacific Northwest and the Missouri River Basin with the National Integrated Drought Information System. For those of you who are not familiar with NIDIS and the Pacific Northwest DUES or Drought Early Warning uh, System, I just wanted to give, provide a little bit of background. Our mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks by providing those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and to Prepare, prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. So we really want to improve our understanding of how and why drought affects society, the economy, and the environment, and improve accessibility, dissemination, and use of early warning information for drought risk management. Our approach is to achieve that goal is to build the foundation of a national drought early warning system through the development of regional drought early warning systems where networks of partners and stakeholders share information and action that help communicate uh, communities cope with drought. So um, we recognize that the impacts of drought and early warning information differ across regions. So each dues has many of the same base ingredients, but ultimately their own flavor to reflect the needs of that region. Um, the Pacific Northwest dues was originally launched in February 2016, and our strategic plan is available on drought.gov. So please mark your calendars. Our next Drought and Climate Outlook webinar will be on February 25th of 2019. Um, I also want to highlight the Healthy Soils, Healthy Region workshop will be happening in March, and information on that workshop and submitting abstracts will be available in both the webinar announcement email you got um, last week, as well as the post-webinar email you'll receive after this webinar. And finally, to facilitate our early warning system, more precipitation observations are needed, and we encourage you to join COCORAS, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. This is a unique nonprofit community-based network of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds working together to measure and map precipitation, rain, hail, and snow, as well as condition reporting. Observ observations by COCORAS observers of precip events and the lack of precip are important 
to capture and improve our understanding of weather. And we will post um, the different coordinators in your region in the chat box if you're interested in learning more. All right, thanks, Britt. Uh, next, we'll turn it over to our first speaker to do the climate recap, um, Kelsey Jensko. Well, thanks, Megan, and uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I'm getting my presentation up and running. Can Is it visible, Megan? Um, yes, it is. We can see it in presentation mode. It is in presentation mode and not in notes mode. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm excited to be here today to present the climate and drought recap and a kind of a summarization of recent conditions. Um, I think as a whole, we can all say that it's been unseasonably dry and warm weather uh, in the last couple of months and the last month across the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I can certainly attest to this here in Missoula, Montana. Here's a I've shown a picture uh, of my son and I at around this time last year in a whiteout snow event at our uh, local ski area. Um, we need a lot more of these types of events if we're going to catch up on our mountain snowpack going into the spring. And uh, currently, you know, here in Missoula, Montana, it's actually raining uh, due to warmer than average temperatures. So uh, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to focus on how conditions we've experienced in the last couple of months, as well as more recently in the last month and last week. Uh, compared to historical conditions. So specifically, I'll focus on a 60-day precipitation and temperature rankings across the Pacific Northwest region. Uh, we'll zoom in and look at temperature and precipitation uh, anomalies um, as a percentage of normal for the last 30 days, and ultimately describe and discuss how that has impacted our soil moisture, our shallow soil moisture, our stream flows, um, and importantly, especially for this time of year, our snowpack. Ultimately, these conditions all lead to drought conditions, which have expanded uh, over the last couple of weeks for the Pacific Northwest region. So let's start by taking a look at uh, temperature and precipitation rankings uh, for the last three months. Uh, these rankings that I'll show here in map form are from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. Uh, and here I've, I'm comparing September to November average temperatures and precipitation, uh, comparing these to conditions that have occurred across the last 124 years. So larger numbers here, up to 124, indicate very warm conditions, and these are depicted in red uh, to light red shading, uh, or very wet conditions in green for precipitation. Smaller numbers down to one indicate increasingly cooler temperatures in blue or very dry conditions in terms of precipitation in brown colors. So we're going to start with the figure on the left, and it shows temperature ranks by climate divisions uh, across the states within the Pacific Northwest region. The area that really stands out here uh, is in the coastal region of western uh, Washington and Oregon. Here, temperatures have been about a bit, have been above average to much above average for the last three months, and this is generally consistent with drought conditions and decreased snowpacks that have been seen in these regions. There's also a small region in eastern Idaho that has been above normal in terms of temperature. Uh, the remainder of the region for the last three months as a whole has seen near average temperatures for the three month period. Um, but as I'll note in the next upcoming slide, uh, it has gotten much warmer in the last month. Moving on to the figure to the right, the three month precipitation rankings are below average to much below average for the majority of the region, uh, excepting southern Idaho. This is consistent with our low snowpacks, low soil moisture values, and continued and expanded drought across the region. The big story, the real big story here is the coastal area of Western Oregon, uh, which is continuing to experience uh, uh, dry, one of the driest three month periods on record. Okay, so let's take a, a smaller window of time. Let's look at the last 30 days or the last one month's uh, uh, temperature and precipitation uh, uh, values. Moving forward, uh, I'm going to show what we've experienced in the last couple of weeks or the last 30 days. And in this slide, I've shown the temperature departure from the mean for the last 30 days. Temperatures from this window of time are compared across the period from 1981 to 2010. And I've pulled this data from the Climate Impacts Research Consortium's uh, Climate Toolbox. It's a very uh, good tool uh, that provides summarizations of temperature, precipitation, and other climatic variables related to drought. Um, so 
White values here in this figure uh, indicate near normal temperatures. White to blue shading represents colder than normal temperatures, and red shading indicates warmer than normal temperatures. And as you can see from the map, there's a large expansive area uh, covered in red. The mass majority of the region is covered in red, indicating temperatures that have been upwards of two to three degrees warmer than normal for this time of year. Uh, there were pockets of below normal temperature for Eastern Oregon and Southern Idaho. One of the results of the above normal temperatures along the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades uh, has been precipitation in the form of rain at lower elevations instead of snow, and some losses of accumulated snowpack at our lower elevation uh, uh, areas. Okay, here's a look at precipitation for the last 30 days, and I've shown this here as a percentage of the mean value from 1981 to 2010. As an example of how to read this, dark red areas would represent 0 to 10 percent as an example of the mean or little to no precipitation. White to light green areas would represent approximately 100 percent of the normal precipitation for the last 30 days, uh, and dark green shading indicates upwards of 200 percent or two times the normal precipitation. Uh, generally, what you can see from this, uh, across the majority of the region, we see a lot of red and this is indicating below normal precipitation. Values ranging from 30% of normal occur along the Rocky Mountains uh, to 50 to 70% along the Cascades regions. Uh, these 30-day trends are consistent with the longer, uh, longer-term three-month observations and actually indicate an expansion of dryness in Montana and Idaho over the last one-month period. Okay, so let's, let's talk a Oh, excuse me. So let's take a look at more recent temperature and precipitation. Uh, here are the observations from the last seven days. On the left-hand side, we have temperatures, and they've remained similar to the one-month trend. Generally, temperatures have been three to four degrees warmer than average for Washington and western portions of Oregon. In addition, northern Idaho and Montana along the Rocky Mountain on the, and the west side of the Rocky Mountain front have seen above average temperatures, and these have ranged from one to four degrees above normal. There is a swath of average to slightly below average temperatures that extends from eastern Oregon into southern Idaho. On the right, I've shown the seven-day precipitation anomaly. Big story here is that we have seen some moisture across Washington and portions a sliver of northern and, and northeastern Oregon, and this is indicated by the green, sh green shading here. Um, what, I'd, what I'd state here, though, is that while this moisture is welcome, it's about 100% to 110% of average, it's not been significant enough to alter drought conditions observed in most of these areas. Uh, the trend in dryness continued across the majority of Oregon, Idaho, and western Montana, as indicated by the brown shading. Okay, so this time of year, and as an uh, effect of both precipitation and temperature occurrences, uh, snowpack becomes really important, and this is a big story across the Pacific Northwest. So let's talk about where we stand in terms of average snowpack conditions uh, for the winter. Uh, or the winter thus far. Snowpack is a key indicator that foreshadows anticipated drought conditions moving into the spring and summer. I've shown the percent of average snow water equivalent for December 15th across the mountainous regions of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, these data are from measured snow water equivalent at snow pillow sites across the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades. Uh, you can think of snow water equivalent as the amount of water that would exist at a depth if we were to melt the entire snowpack in a given location. In this figure, I've shown the snowpack snow water equivalent conditions for the hydrologic unit code or HUC6 watersheds across the regions. Uh, generally, we see orange across the board and it indicates below normal snowpack conditions. Basins and portions of Montana and Idaho west of the Rocky Mountain Divide are generally 50 to 70 percent of the 30 year median for this time of year. In the Cascades, extending uh, from northern Washington to southern Oregon, conditions are even drier with snowpack, snow water equivalents ranging from 50% to almost 25% of the normal median, so very low snowpack there. Taken as a whole, the conditions are, worry are pretty worrisome for soil moisture and groundwater recharge moving into the spring. Uh, we'll need to play catch up in the upcoming months to accumulate and store enough snowpack uh, to recharge our depleted soil water stores and sustain stream flows in the upcoming summer. So it's going to be really important to pay attention to the seasonal forecast uh, as we plan for drought in the upcoming months and into the spring and summer. Okay, 
uh, the drought conditions coming out of the fall, as well as lack of recent precipitation, has really set the stage for soil moisture conditions. Soil moisture is factored into forecasts as an indicator of wet or dry basin conditions and the potential for drought as we move into the spring. I've shown the Climate Prediction Center's moder modeled soil moisture anomaly for November in this figure. Deficits uh, in soil moisture from negative 20 to negative 120 millimeters are indicated with light orange uh, to red shading. Surpluses would be indicated uh, from 20 to 80 millimeters, and they'd be indicated by light green to dark green shading. Areas that stand out in terms of large soil moisture deficits include western Oregon, Oregon at the extreme end with a swath of below normal soil moisture extending outward and upward across the majority of the region, uh, excepting in this case, eastern Idaho. So moving on to the impacts of both uh, soil moisture and precipitation, uh, really what, what we think about in terms of a hydrologic drought, uh, we can take a look at uh, current stream flow conditions. Here's a map of USGS stream gauges and flow rankings across the Pacific Northwest uh, for, as an average, the past week. Across the gauge network, blue symbols indicate greater than 90 percentile flows for this time period, so this would be above average flows. Light blue is between 76 to 90th, green is the 25th to 75th percentile, and orange here is 10 to 24th uh, fourth percentile. One thing to note is that many gauges don't currently appear on the map. Uh, they're shown as hollow symbols, and this is due to frozen stilling wells and river conditions at the gauge site. The big story from this map is that there are vast amounts of streams in the western portions of Oregon and southern Idaho that are experiencing below normal to much below normal flows. Um, these flow conditions and low flows are associated with the summer drought conditions and continued lack of fall and winter recharge. Uh, this has led to depleted soil moisture and groundwater stores. Generally, the majority of gauges across Washington are recording normal to above normal stream flows. Um, but there are numerous gauges in western Montana that are below average, and this is related to the lack of precipitation and persistence of drought conditions that we came out of from last summer, especially in northwestern Montana. Okay, so summing all of these observations up, let's take a look at last week's drought monitor, and this is being updated today. Uh, the new one will come out uh, on Wednesday, uh, but this is from last week. Uh, this was drawn up by Curtis Reganti of the National Drought Mitigation Center. Um, and really this reflects the precipitation, temperature, uh, and antecedent conditions experienced uh, from the fall moving into the winter. Despite the recent precipitation, at least in the last week in northwestern Oregon, uh, short and long-term precipitation deficits were still large enough and surface and groundwater shortages were still severe enough to expand the footprint of extreme drought uh, in, in Oregon itself. Abnormally dry conditions expanded through parts of Washington due to precipitation deficits in the last month, uh, and this is associated with the yellow shading in this figure. Additionally, dry conditions expanded through parts of the mountains of central Idaho and in mountainous regions of the north of northwestern Montana. Here, low snowpack exists and short-term precipitation deficits are continuing to grow. So to conclude the climate recap, recap and drought summary, uh, in a general sense, when we think about temperature and precipitation, uh, it has been warm, warmer than average and drier than average, uh, and especially in the last two months and in the near term. Uh, these conditions and summer fall deficits, uh, summer and fall deficits that we're still experiencing are contributing to reductions in soil moisture across the vast majority of the Pacific Northwest, reductions in stream flow, especially in Western Oregon, and an expansion of winter drought conditions. So one thing we need to really keep an eye on is uh, our snowpack drought that we are currently experiencing. And I will wrap right, it up. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, we don't have time for questions now, so let's move right on to Andrea's, uh, Andrea Baer with the Climate Outlook. Okay, thanks, Megan. Um, let me know, hold on. See. You can see my screen. Andrea, we see um, your. Oh, there we go. Now we. Now okay. you're in the right view. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the climate outlooks and the drought outlooks coming from the Climate Prediction Center, and a little bit about whether or not this El Nino is going to happen. 
Uh, so I'm going to start out with the summary and I'll end with that as well. The Climate Prediction Center still has us in an El Nino watch. Uh, the sea surface temperatures have been for about the last six weeks above average across pretty much the entire Pacific Ocean, um, tropical Pacific Ocean, but the atmosphere just has not uh, kicked in yet. And we need both of those uh, in place in order to get this El Nino going. So the patterns of convection and the winds are mostly near average or showing ENSO neutral conditions still in the tropical Pacific. Uh, they are still forecasting. It's a 90% or greater chance that um, this El Nino event will, will happen uh, this winter and continue through spring. Quick look back and uh, look at where we are. Uh, the blue indicates La Nina events. These are the seasons, so December, January, February, um, October, November, December, et cetera. So if you look at where we are right now, uh, we are at 0.7, which uh, we need about a 0.5 in the sea surface temperatures to start looking at, uh, at El Nino conditions. So this first season of September, October, and November has met that threshold. Like I said, those sea surface temperatures have been pretty warm, uh, especially meeting that um, positive 0.5 degrees C for the past six weeks. So we'll see if we get uh, the next several seasons above, uh, above normal conditions in, in the tropical Pacific or not. Uh, here's where we are with the weekly sea surface temperature departures. And the sweet spot that we like to look at is this, what we call the Nino 3.4 area. Uh, here's the dateline, here's the coast of South America, and here's the equator. So it's this area right in here that they're looking at the uh, sea surface temperatures. And as you can see, uh, since uh, the early part of June, we've been uh, above normal, um, or on the positive side, I shouldn't say above normal, but on the positive side. And then um, definitely uh, moving up there well over that to positive 0.5 degrees C. Um, gosh, since, um, since October. So uh, here's a look at the sea surface temperatures across the globe. And interesting to note, um, as of right now, the Pacific Ocean is, is relatively quite warm, the, the whole basin, uh, really, um, also the Indian Ocean. Um, and you can see this um, very warm area that stretches really from South America all the way to uh, the Western Pacific. But what I want you to look at is the change in the last month. And you can see that area up there that was really warm starting to cool a bit, um, starting to get those cooler temperatures in here, uh, and continuing that warm area from the dateline uh, through the Eastern um, Pacific. The upper 300 meters of the ocean has been quite warm since um, the latter part of February, really peaked quite high in October, um, has cooled a little bit, but um, going back up a tad bit. So again, just stressing those very warm waters out there. Uh, but what we really want to see, um, we really would like to see some uh, convection or some cloudiness uh, around the dateline area, and that's indicated in these blue shadings. What we're looking for is negative um, outgoing long wave radiation. You don't really need to get the outgoing long wave radiation part. Just what I'm trying to show you here is we want these blue areas. We want to see where there's cloudiness right there in that sweet spot near the dateline. But what we really see close to that is actually suppression. So that's not good. We want to see, we want to see that um, cloudiness going on near the dateline. And then we also want those trade winds to start weakening across the tropical Pacific or even reverse. And that hasn't really happened uh, in the month of November. We did have a little bit of, um, of weakening, but that was not really due to El Nino. That was more due to some sub-seasonal um, interactions going on in the Pacific, um, largely the Madden-Julian oscillation. So not really ENSO yet. Um, like I said earlier, we do still have in the forecast 90% uh, or above 90% um, chance that uh, El Nino will form. If it does form, uh, we're, we're really expecting it to be on the weak side. And when I say weak side, don't, don't think of that as weaker impacts. Think of that as a less 
predictability that we have. So we we have, unfortunately, uh, less confidence in in the fact that sometimes in the Pacific Northwest you get warmer or drier. So things are are less predictable when we have a weaker event. Not necessarily that we're going to get weaker impacts. So and then as you can see, this event is supposed to continue through the spring, and these are the seasons down here. So again, uh, December, January, and February through um, through March, April, May, really, et cetera. So. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll see this happen. Um, a majority of the models, except for a few rogue ones, there are are really continuing to predict this is going to go off and continuing to um, to hone in on the fact that those warm uh, global sea surface temperatures in the Pacific are going to stay warm. And um, this just shows um, a whole bunch of uh, different model runs, the dynamical models up here and the statistical models, but really all of them are indicating uh, we're going to stay above those thresholds. So you can see in here, uh, the green is the average of the statistical models and the red is the average of the dynamical models. So that's kind of the line to pay attention to right there. I like to show these graphics because really, um, El Ninos are different. We, we have typical things that happen when there's a strong relationship, but but there is a lot of variability in predicting El Nino and predicting what impacts we're going to see from that. So this set of graphics shows you the strong events we've had since 1950. And so they're right through here where I'm showing you with my cursor. And as you can see, um, there is variability. You can't really say, yeah, it's always, um, wet or it's always dry because you get those happening with strong El Ninos, the same with moderate El Ninos. Um, but then when you get into uh, the weak events, things just look a bit more washed out in a lot of cases. Again, really, I just want to stress with these, the variability. It's, it's very difficult to predict. El Nino does give us uh, some tilt in the odds or some help with our predictions, but definitely a lot of variability. And then the Climate Prediction Center did put together some snowfall anomalies for El Nino years. If you're to combine all of them, whether they're weak or moderate or strong, uh, the Pacific Northwest does get, uh, tend to get uh, less snowfall during El Nino years. And then if you look at the weakest and the strongest, uh, again, um, and this is what we're looking at right here if this El Nino does form to, to be weak. Um, so. Um, looking like it, it tends to be in the Pacific Northwest where you get less snowfall. Okay, so switching to the seasonal temperature outlook, this is for December, January, and February. And I just picked Seattle here. And um, basically there is a pretty good shift in the odds um, that temperatures will be above normal. I think we're, we're headed well in that direction right now. Um, but um, for, for much of, of the U.S., they are um, calling for above normal uh, temperatures for that winter season. Um, but as we move into temp or, excuse me, precipitation, there's a lot less predictability with precipitation. And right now, there's really nothing in our tools that's telling us uh, one way or the other whether we're going to be below near or above normal up in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm sorry about that. I wish I did have something um, predictability-wise for you guys up there, but there just isn't anything um, screaming at us right now to give us the confidence to um, put out that forecast. Looking at the seasonal drought outlook, uh, looks like definitely they're expecting drought to persist on um, the eastern uh, three quarters of Oregon and um, up into Washington. Um, and then remaining but improving some along the coast or along the western side of those cascades. Uh, and then continuing right along the border with um, persisting uh, right along the border with Canada and the US. So basically, um, we ha still have an El Nino watch. Um, the ocean is ready to go. It is warm, it is primed, and it's looking like it's met all of its thresholds. We're just waiting for convection and precipitation to um, to feed back off of those warm waters in the in the Pacific in order for this El Nino event or yes, El Nino event to go off. Um, so with that, I will give you back the time, Megan. 
All right, thank you so much, Andrea. I'm not seeing any questions, so let's just move right along to our next speaker. Uh, we'll turn it over to Gabrielle Roche McNally to talk to us about the key findings of the Northwest chapter of the National Climate Assessment. All right, just getting my uh, presentation here. Uh, hopefully you can see it and hear me. Good. Okay, all right, well, thanks so much. I'm just gonna give you a real quick snapshot here today about what you might find in the National Climate Assessment uh, for the Northwest chapter. Again, um, just a little, little snippet. Uh, so I just wanna acknowledge the fantastic group of authors who are on this chapter. Uh, Chris May is our lead author and Charlie Luce was our coordinating lead author. And I'll just note that um, our lead authors uh, really helped to put together a really fantastic team. Uh, Phil Moat was the lead author in the beginning and then stepped down uh, for professional reasons. And so we, uh, but he put together a fantastic group of folks representing a diversity of disciplines and really organizations that we represent. Uh, so um, today I'm just gonna kind of cover the key messages that are presented in our chapter and then talk about a case study that we outlined in 2015 that might give us a sense of what we could expect more of in the future for the Northwest. Uh, and I'll just note that one of the ways that we really tried to orient our key messages were what are, what are the things that are special about the Northwest and what do we value and how might they be impacted by climate change? So our first key message is really around the natural resource economy. And we note that climate change has already affected the Northwest kind of diverse natural resource system. And these natural resources provide sustainable livelihoods, a foundation for rural, tribal, and indigenous communities, and can strengthen local economies. And we expect that climate change is going to continue affecting the natural resource sector. Uh, but we do note in our key message and in the section that, you know, these impacts are really going to be variable and they depend on future market dynamics as well as the actions that managers and communities take to respond to climate change. So one a quick example that I just wanna show here that's presented in the chapter is sort of the importance of the natural resource industry in terms of jobs and sales revenue. So both for Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, um, the natural resource economy, which we've included agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, in it are a really important part, not just of our economies, but also of our communities, mostly in rural spaces and places. And uh, they provide important economic revenue for the states that they um, operate in. So um, I'll just kind of move on to the next key message, which really kind of thinks again about this natural world, uh, but we focus on sort of cultural heritage. So not just the economic um, benefits of the natural resource sector, but also kind of what are those um, values and benefits that the natural world, world provides to the Northwest. Uh, so we note that climate change and extreme events have already endangered the well-being of wildlife, fish, and plants, and that we make a strong tie to those resources and the importance of tribal subsistence culture, as well as outdoor recreation activities, which are incredibly important in our region. <clears throat> and we note that climate change is going to continue to have adverse impacts on the regional environment. And this is gonna have impacts on the values, identity, heritage, culture, and really quality of life of our region's diverse population. Uh, but we, to we do talk about um, how there are some adaptation strategies uh, that will increase the resilience of our uh, region's natural capital, uh, particularly those that are culturally appropriate and think about the importance of natural resource sector and as it ties to um, communities. So one example that we present in our work here is really around the threat of climate change on our salmonid species in the Northwest, um, which are threatened due to climate change as well as a suite of other factors that uh, folks on this call may be quite aware of. Uh, and this picture is from a first salmon ceremony of the Puyallup tribe and we really kind of talk about Pacific salmon as this keystone species in the Northwest from an ecological perspective, but also from a cultural perspective, and that um, the decline of salmon will have economic, social, and cultural impacts in our region. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is just, again, one example of, of some of the ways that these intersections will be impacted, these cultural um, and natural resources connections will be impacted by climate change. 
For our third key message, um, we focused on infrastructure. Uh, and so we talked a lot about water, transportation, and energy infrastructures and how they're already really impacted by extreme weather events from flooding, landslides, drought, wildfire, and heat waves. And we're expecting that climate change is really going to increase the risks associated with these extreme events and um, particularly compromising the reliability of water supplies, hydropower, and transportation in our region. Uh, we also note that there will be communities that are more vulnerable to these impacts, especially those um, systems that lack redundancy and are often in more rural um, communities. Uh, and then we note that there are adaptation strategies that really, especially those that are kind of addressing more than one sector and that are kind of coupling social and environmental co-benefits uh, can help increase resilience in the region. Uh, so one example that we provide in the um, chapter is around these single source water systems. We just present data from Washington. We didn't have uh, similar data from Oregon and Idaho, but this map uh, just shows um, public water systems in Washington that are single source or they lack up they lack a backup supply. And these are for smaller services that have at least 25 people per day or 15 or more connections. And uh, so we just note that these folks are going to increasingly uh, deal with challenges associated with climate, particularly those um, associated with flooding, drought, and saltwater intrusion. And then we note those with um, here in terms of um, well depth and those with shallower wells are likely more um, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And in the map, just to note, if it's hard to see, the purple dots are um, those with um, wells that are less than 100 feet. Um, or greater than 100 feet, and then um, the orange is 50 to 100 feet, and, uh, and the blues are um, greater than 50 feet. So um, just to give you a sense of, of um, what are some of the vulnerabilities in Washington. So our key message in um, number four is around health, and this is really about um, a whole suite of impacts associated with public health. Uh, we talk a lot about the organizations and volunteers that really make up the social safety net, and they're already stretched thin with, stretched thin with current demands. Uh, we expect that healthcare and social systems are going to be further challenged with increasing, increasing frequency of acute events. And um, we also kind of look at, you know, there's an increased likelihood of hazards and epidemics. Uh, and we also expect the disruptions in local economies and food systems are projected to result in more chronic health risks. So we're gonna to expect to see more acute events as well as chronic health risks in the future due to climate change. Uh, but there are some potential um, health code benefits of future climate mitigation efforts and um, community health efforts um, done in the region that can help kind of counterbalance these risks and hopefully create some more resilient health systems. So again, one example that we present in this chapter is really kind of healthcare partnerships that can increase resilience. So what are some of the uh, positive examples in our region that are kind of addressing uh, these intersecting vulnerabilities in communities uh, to help improve health in the context of climate change? Uh, and so um, this is an example of a 2017 Northwest International Transformational Resilience Coalition Conference uh, that was focused on building psychosocial resilience to climate change. And this was an example of ways uh, that climate change is, is integrated in the public health efforts in our region more and more. And I'll just note that in this uh, key message, we focus a lot on the mental health impacts of climate change and with some particular impacts on tribal and indigenous communities and other place-based um, communities who are very reliant on natural resource base. So there's the economic and sort of cultural impacts as well as the health impacts that we cover in this uh, key message. In our fifth key message, we focus on frontline communities. Uh, and so communities on the front lines of climate change are the ones who experience the first and often the worst effects of climate change. And uh, we focus specifically on tribes and indigenous peoples and those that are most dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods and those that are economically disadvantaged. When you read the chapter, you'll note that we focus primarily again on these tribes and indigenous peoples, um, farm workers, and those kind of working in the natural resource sector and the urban poor and homeless. And we note that these communities generally prioritize basic needs such as shelter, food, and transportation, and they 
often lack economic and political captor, capital uh, and therefore are more vulnerable to climate disruptions. Uh, but we do try to focus on the positive of kind of the social and cultural cohesion that's inherent in many of these communities and how this um, can increase their capacity um, for building resilience and reducing vulnerability. And again, one example that we show is some work of the Pacific Northwest Tribal Climate Change Network uh, and efforts um, with the 2017 uh, Tribes and First Nations Climate Summit, which is just one example of, of some regional efforts to bring a diversity of folks together to, to um, address how we're going to build community um, solutions to climate change in a tribal indigenous um, context here. And then finally, uh, again, just to note that what um, we brought out and talked quite a bit in an extended case study in our chapter was about what happened in 2015 in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, uh, and um, which was um, which beat um, many sort of heat and precipitation records uh, for the region. And we expect that um, this pr can provide a glimpse into the Northwest future of uh, something that might be more common. Um, many of us here in Oregon in, in particular faced a drought um, with some similar conditions this year. And as we just noted in these presentations, we may be uh, likely to experience um, more drought and um, higher temperatures in the coming year. And uh, so there are lots of examples about what happened in 2015 that we highlight in our chapter. I don't have time to get into those. I'll just note that um, one example we present is declining reservoirs. Uh, this is a sample from the Detroit Lake Reservoir, which was at record low levels in 2015. Uh, and then we uh, present some uh, kind of supplemental watering of livestock during drought. This was experienced in 2015 and in many parts of Oregon in particular, again here in um, 2018. That those are just two examples of some of the consequences of that drought. So I don't have time to dig into more. I uh, encourage folks to check out um, our chapter and uh, there are lots of good resources on the website there to get more information about um, the Northwest chapter and the rest of the um, NCA4. All right, thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, one quick question for you before we move on. Uh, uh, the question was, why wasn't the tourism and the creation economy included in the natural resource economy numbers? Oh, so you know what? Um, we do actually have some numbers in the actual chapter. Uh, just the figure that we presented here um, was, we didn't have the same data that we could present for the region, but if you actually read our chapter, we go into quite depth um, some of the economic consequences to recreation for our region. It just wasn't presented in that figure I showed you here today, but we talk about in key message one, the economic consequences uh, to the natural resource sector, including recreation. And then in the key message two, we talk about impacts to recreation more from kind of a cultural um, values and way of life for the region. So it's definitely there. I just wasn't able to present it here. All right, thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, why don't we move on to Roger Pawardi to give us some key findings of the water chapter. Sure. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, this is chapter three on the water. Just to keep in mind the way the report was structured for the entire national assessment, uh, we had uh, overview, short sectoral chapters such as water, agriculture, issues like that. The regional chapters of which you just heard one, Pacific Northwest and uh, so on. And then uh, two key chapters on um, adaptation and mitigation and on multiple stresses to make that three, sorry. So I just wanted to give a sense of why these are broken down this way. So I'm gonna to speak to the general national view of water and what that means in the context of, um, in part the Northwest, which you just heard, but in, in terms of future risks that you heard from Andrea and Kelsey as well. So next slide. So, Classically, and everyone on the phone, of course, knows this, we've been saying this for a long time, significant changes in water quantity and quality are evident across the country from variable pre precip, rising temperature, reduced snow to rain ratios, which you heard quite a bit about just now. And the key being, as we know, the ongoing risk is coupled to human and natural systems and to those services that these provide. So I wanted to make sure we get that statement clear out of the way that in fact, we are working from this knowledge base in order to talk about uh, the near term and the future. Next. 
So groundwater depletion is exacerbating drought risk, and I'll point out that, uh, where and why that's happening in a second. And then surface water quality is declining as water temperature increases, and more frequent high-intensity rainfall events mobilize pollutants and sediments and nutrients. This is actually fairly new in the context of um, the work that was done in previous assessments, simply because there was not a lot done on water quality. We didn't have enough to know um, just how variability in terms of quality was affected other than how low stream flows affects water quality. So this is an important statement. Next slide. So the classic sort of estimate that we do across NOAA and across um, you know, our partners in industry and elsewhere is to show where are these losses in terms of weather and climate uh, events across the United States. Now this figure is in the report, but the main reason I wanted to show this was that of course, you can see these uh, increases in terms of impacts, and, and we know these are driven by uh, population demand. Um, but the question is then, where are these trends heading in given the, all of those drivers, the changing environment, the changing population, the changing um, relative demand? And when we put all of that together, what we end up with are surprises in the system. And this is discussed in large part in the water chapters, the, the uh, adaptation chapter and the multiple stresses chapter. Next slide. So here's the depletion of groundwater in major U.S. Uh, aquifers. So we estimate that agriculture uses about, um, about for, for its functions, about 40% of its water use comes from groundwater and supplies, as we know, have been decreasing over time. And in some areas, uh, such as uh, uh, the southern Great Plains on the Oglala, it can get up to 1.6 or even higher kilometers cube a year. Um, we could put that in the right context. That's a lot of acre feet. And in that setting, what we're seeing for many parts of the country is the offsetting of declines in surface flow by even, even increased groundwater extraction. And one of the things in the context of the Northwest and in the Southwest as you know, when it comes to transboundary groundwater um, aquifers, we have very little coordination across the boundaries in terms of how we manage groundwater. We have good agreements on surface water. We're renegotiating the Columbia River Treaty as we speak, but on the groundwater side, it's virtually non-existent. Next. So deteriorating water infrastructure compounds the climate risks faced by society. This is a major, I wouldn't say finding, we know this, the trends in water infrastructure are very interesting in this context. We estimate that about 80 of the 88,000 well monitored dams across the country, about 15,000 are at present at high risk for a system failure. Um, and or in some cases like Elephant Butte in the southern um, Rio Grande for sedimentation and other issues like that. So the deteriorating water infrastructure doesn't always have to do with age. We have some aging infrastructure that's working very well. It's just that there are some key features and some key areas in which that infrastructure deterioration is actually exacerbating the impacts of climate extremes. The extreme precip events pose greater risk for infrastructure failure in some regions, but infrastructure design, operation, financing, and regulatory standards have not yet taken into account these types of changes. Next slide. Um, please. Next. So current risk management does not typically consider the impact of compound extremes. And what do we mean by that? The co-occurrence of multiple events, floods and droughts. In 2011 and 2012, the upper Midwest had a major flood, which then led to a drought. And it was the first year, three years on record, including 2013, in which corn yield actually declined across the middle of the United States since the Dust Bowl. Similarly, we saw other events such as the drought to flood conditions in California when Oroville Dam was um, basically threatened with, um, with failure. This pay plays is playing into a series of risks that we have not yet got our heads around how to really understand the cascading infrastructure potential for failure. And this is posing a major conundrum to us because what we're seeing are compound risks occurring. Next slide. When we look at some of this, and you can see the Colorado River Basin supply and use, and I'll come back to the Northwest as well in a second, as around, say, 1995, we saw the water use basically exceeding the water supply for the 10-year running average, the demand basically exceeding the supply in the river. Of course, what that means is, given those social and economic trends, given 
the declines and runoff, and it's not all precip driven, a lot of this is driven by uh, warmer temperatures and evaporation, it doesn't take a major drought to put the system at risk. And for the first time since the building of um, uh, Glen Canyon Dam, we are experimenting this year with shortage criteria on the Colorado River starting on January 1. So this poses a new area in which we're basically exceeding the supply of the system and have completely closed the watershed in terms of its use. Next. So here's a broad figure from the Climate Change Science Report, which was part one of the National Climate Assessment on potential tipping elements and these sorts of compound events. And we can see the larger scale things, um, you know, El Nino, uh, potential uh, boreal forests, um, permafrost and carbon as sort of the large scale background changes. But when we, we look at maximum temperature and precipitation, we see a clustering in hot and dry. And what that really means is that in the places in which we're seeing dry conditions, they're also hotter than they have been. Everybody knows, everybody has felt from you know everything from the 1950s drought and elsewhere that yes, sure, when it's drier, it's warmer. But we're actually even seeing that during droughts, the temperatures are even warmer than we expected. Next slide. So what does that leave us with? If you look at, this is all from the Climate Change Science Report, uh, the changes in consecutive dry days for if we do if we are able to reduce our emissions versus if we continue as we are, and the rapid emissions reductions, annual precip precip uh, annual uh, maximum precipitation. What this tells us when we put some of these things together, and we've been seeing it in the data, is that for many parts of the country, when a drought happens, we're actually seeing at the same time, warming temperatures. Why is that important? Not just for the added stress on livelihoods, on working conditions, and on, um, uh, on economic operations, but we're actually seeing that impact in terms of what we're calling ballooning or flash droughts. In, nine, in 2012, the aerial extent of the United States was in drought at about 30% in May, and in, the, in a matter of three months, it jumped to about 66%, simply because we had features set up and the warmer temperatures, not all anthropogenic, but the warmer temperatures actually started the land surface feedback, starting pulling moisture out of the soil, starting pulling moisture out of our storage systems that actually exacerbated the drought conditions. So these sort of compound events are not something that we're taking into planning right now. Another example of this is uh, at this time when we think about coastal flooding, we actually study the flooding coming from the land side and from the sea level side as two different phenomena and model them differently. And they're not in many cases linked together to have both the sea level rise, wave heights, and the onshore flooding. And that is the type of compounding risk that we're talking about that we're not fully aware yet on how to handle. Next. So the key message three, water management in the changing future. Water management strategies are designed in view of an evolving future. We can only part partially anticipate. We've heard about stationarity and non-stationarity and using things from the past, um, but the past is what we have experienced. We have to look at how we've managed and what we've learned from that. We can't simply ignore it. Current water management typically do not address risks that changes, change over time, leaving us exposed to more risk than anticipated. Next slide. So there, but there are examples of promising approaches to managing climate risk. But the gap between research and implementation, especially in view of the constraints under which we're operating, both private sector, um, government, government and governance constraints remains a challenge. Next slide. But if we look at the U.S. GDP and U.S. water withdrawals, we see that our actual water withdrawals have leveled off since the mid-70s, and it has not, in fact, impacted the fast rising rate of the economy. We don't have this figure in the report, but we discuss it. We discuss the results of this figure in detail in the chapter. Next slide. So there it is in 1975. And the reason why this happened in, in retrospect is through the introduction of efficient technology, laws and regulatory demands being actually put into place and the innovations that came from them in terms of efficiency and the behavioral changes from the standpoint of education, awareness, and the use of it in, um, information about water uh, quality and scarcity. 
this is an interesting figure because it basically says we can, in fact, do upfront changes that level off the rate at which we consume resources without impacting the economy in a major way. However, the one caveat I will put to this, next slide, comes from what I said earlier about uh, infrastructure. Here's the drinking water investment, the 20-year projected need for storage, source water, transmission and distribution, and other over the next 20 years that are needed to bring all of these systems back up to operating standards. So this makes the point that, in fact, yes, we're good on the education awareness. Um, we're not completely good on um, how we adapt and adjust. There's this background aging infrastructure and the need to upgrade that infrastructure that actually can make a climate hazard have a major, a bigger impact than it would have normally had. And this is these figures that I'm showing here are discussed in that chapter three of the report. Next slide. One of the final things we observe in the report is looking in some other parts of the world on transboundary watersheds, Colorado, Columbia, we have them here, of course, Great Lakes and elsewhere, but just the opportunity to learn from and contribute to other regions, especially on transboundary issues exists. And there is a set of efforts to learn and, and people are familiar with folks like Aaron Wolf and others who have been looking at how we deal with transboundary issues, but introducing this new idea of a changing environment and compound extremes into how we negotiate. Next slide. So I wanted to put up this last slide. This comes from the adaptation chapter, just to give you a sense that I think there's been a lot that's been done since the third national climate assessment. There's a lot of new partnerships, stakeholder engagements, but in terms of learning across from monitoring and evaluation, awareness, assessment, planning, and implementation, we've been good, as I pointed out, on getting at uh, issues surrounding uh, management of use, leveling, leveling off of water use, but not from groundwater and not from the standpoint of addressing how these changes will affect us given an aging infrastructure. Next slide. So in summary, there are changes in water quality and quantity, and I guess I put it twice to emphasize that there's a lot of changes in water quantity and quality. Water management in a changing future, next. Effective adaptation is, le is learning-based and iterative, as you can tell from the trends in the slides, but opportunities exist for us to con learn and contribute to other regions, next. And finally, Examples of promising approaches to manage climate risks exist, but the gap between research and implementation remains a challenge, especially regarding compounds and risks and cascading risks. And that's just a summary of all the things we just discussed. Next slide. And these are the folks who were involved in Chapter 3. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Roger. If there are any questions out there, please feel free to type them in the chat box or the question box, and we have a, just a couple of minutes to take a few questions. Looks like nobody has any questions. Well, if that's the case, um, please feel free to reach out to Britt if you have any questions that come back, that come up, and she would be happy to connect you with the speakers uh, to get your questions answered. So thanks, everybody, for joining us, and uh, please join us on the next webinar on February 25th. Uh, all right. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks.